Welcome to Friday Focus, September 23rd, 2016. I'm going to talk to you about a few kind of clearinghouse issues. We had had the meeting on Tuesday and we talked about a lot of things that maybe we went by really quickly, so I want to clarify some things. So first off, uh, we're trying to work on getting a more mobile workforce. And a mobile workforce makes us resilient and allows us to kind of go where the needs are. So if we have, let's say, you know, the Warren office is really kind of scheduled to be busy all day, maybe another office, you know, they're overstaffed, we would be able to shift people around to the other office and hopefully not have a negative, uh, you know, financial implication on any of the staff members. And that's really going to be a key is make it so that it's a win-win for everybody so we're not over-hiring, having any excess people and not having to work for them, but then be able to get people to move from office to office. And we're trying to figure out a system to reimburse people for their travel and you know, kind of cover your time and your, uh, and your, you know, your gas gas mileage. And you know, we tried to make different models, and I can kind of shoot holes in any one of them. You know, there's certain situations where what office do people live closest to? What makes the most sense? What works out best? And I talked to people, and based on their individual situations, they had different ideas. So I decided, I decided to kind of keep this, you know, simple, and uh, and let you guys uh, decide how to do it on your own. So what we're going to do is a couple things. So first off, you're going to have your primary workplace which is, you know, you can kind of designate that where you think your primary workplace is. And on the days that you're asked to travel to a remote location, even if it's regularly, to help us, you know, keep production, uh, we're going to count that as a travel day. So there will be a couple things that can happen. First off, if your primary location is, say, 10 miles away, and we're asking you to drive from home to a different location that's maybe 30 miles a day. We say 30 miles minus 10 miles is 20 miles. So the office would pay you for 20 miles of driving time, and 20 miles of driving, and I think the federal rate is 55 cents a mile or 40, 54 cents a mile, so we'll reimburse you a check for that. And also you should figure out, let's say this is a 30 minute drive, and this is a 60 minute drive, and it's round trip, that means 30 minutes each way, so it equals one hour. So you'd say, well, I had to drive the Southgate uh, on Thursday because so-and-so is sick, so I had 20 extra miles and an hour of drive time. And you email that to HR and they will uh, you know, issue you a check. They'll put the uh, time into your time bank and, and the uh, mileage into your miles uh, and give you, give you a check for that. That way your time is covered and your, your miles are covered. Now, if you're at the office and you're working and they ask you to go to another location, well, you're already on the clock, so you don't have to count your hours. You just count your driving time, and we'll reimburse you for that. And the real important things, there's a couple important points I want to stress so you figure out how to do this on your own. Number one, the goal is to have a mobile workforce so we can have our staff repositioned where the demand's at. And the demand might be by an increase in patient demand or a decrease in staffing that occurred unnaturally because people were sick or had time off. So that's part one. Part two is I want you to feel comfortable just going there and know it's not going to have a negative impact on your economics. And the two last points kind of go together. On one hand, you know, if you're kind of cheating, we're going to identify it. You don't know, go to our core values. It's going to be a problem. And if you're somebody that, say, is figuring, well, I'm just going there because I like to work and I'm, I'm a good worker, we're going to kind of encourage you to make sure you're turning your hours. So this is a self turned in thing. We're going to kind of need to be honest, but I'm also going to ask you if you're somebody that routinely drives out there and doesn't ask for anything in return, turn in your time and hours. Okay, if you're driving from here and going there, yeah, you're punched in, I get that, but I don't want you to wear and tear your car to drive from here to Livonia, from Shelby to Livonia, because we needed you to do it. Okay, I was talking to Crystal and Candace at the meeting the other day. I said, how are you guys getting reimbursed for your miles? We're not turning anything in. We'll start turning it in so we can cover you for that. You know, that's something that your, uh, your work owes you. Okay, so that's that's how it's going to go. Uh, we're going to have it where you're going to turn in your additional time it took you to drive there, uh, so you can figure that out in your own. In this, and how many minutes that's going to be, <clears throat> or, or how we want to calculate that out. If you're already working, you're punched in. You don't need to send in your hours, but you, both cases send in your additional miles. So you can just figure it out on your own. You can do a you know a map quest or a, or a Google Maps figure out how many additional miles. Uh, eventually, we might. Uh, have a system after you guys have been doing it for a while we might have a system that we can automate it you take the patient tracker for example the patient tracker where you fill in the outcome of the consults we had the staff kind of start doing it on their own and then we took the best of everybody's uh, patient tracker and we built one that was that could be used you know office-wide the next thing we're going to talk about 
is uh, how you're gonna make decisions. You know, we had an issue on Tuesday where you know, it really wasn't clear who should be making decisions about where staff should go. Sometimes it's not clear who should be making decisions about what kind of you know, equipment we need. Uh, Jesse had told me she needed some new instruments for doing phlebectomy, so she just thought that was like a relatively low cost so she could decide on her own. That's good, she went ahead and ordered what she needed. But then other things might be a, you know, like a more complex decision, might involve more people, might involve bigger expenses, might have a bigger impact in the company. And you know, I've talked to you about frontline leadership. I want to get away from this top-down leadership where you're, where you're asking questions up the chain of command frequently until you get to a no. You, know, you get to a no and then it's like, no, we can't do that. They told us we can't do that. And I hear that all too often. I was meeting the surgery department the other day and they were kind of asking me a lot of things about rules and about conditions. Like, you know, we're supposed to be doing what's best for the patient. We're supposed to be focusing on our brand promise and carrying that out. So there's different kinds of leadership structures. And really, I think when I was rolling this out, I didn't really make it clear to you uh, what exactly frontline leadership meant or who should be involved in making you know, ultimate decisions. So if we look at uh, the different leadership types, there is a democracy. A lot of us might think that you know, the United States of America is a democracy. We're not. We're actually called a democratic republic. So we don't individually vote on laws, but we vote on senators and, and, and uh, congressmen that then vote on our laws. So we're a democratic republic. A democracy means everybody votes. So let's say we decided, uh, do we need to draw people from Shelby out to Southgate on a Wednesday? Then we go, the whole office votes. We'd never get anything done. So democracies in their pure form don't work in a leadership environment. Okay, then there's a monarchy. And that's kind of like, you know, like a traditional leadership model where the boss might be a small mom and pop shop or some company where the boss ultimately makes every decision. It might be a king. You know, a monarchy would be a king and queen where they decide what's going on and make those final decisions. And a lot of, I think, typical business structure is made up of series of monarchies where there's different monarchs at different levels that make the decisions that everybody else must you know, succumb to. So you go and ask your monarch who might be your boss and they make the ultimate the decision for you as if they have some uh, gifted insight in what you need. Okay? And that's really been how traditional leadership in America has been done where you have somebody that's at the head and they tell people exactly what they want them to do. And if they don't do them they fire them or you know, replace them or whatever. And then there's a type of leadership that we're, I'm trying to create here, and it's called meritocracy. So merit, meritocracy, which is where the people making decisions are the ones that have the most merit. So let's say, for example, you're trying to decide uh, whether or not to get new instruments for doing phlebectomy. Well, Jesse decided that if I have more instruments, we don't have to run, worry about how to clean them, and we'll have enough sets to do two or three cases at a time, and we won't be tied up in the uh, outer clay. That was one person. She can make the decision on her own because she has the most merit to make that decision, and that's done. So she didn't need to ask anybody permission to order you know, some instruments. They might have cost $1,000 or something like that. Then you have a situation where I talked with the Vane team yesterday, and they were trying to decide how to reallocate people, how to get people from, say, one office go to the other office. Well, one person making a decision might not be a good idea because they really don't have enough merit to decide what is going on at the other office. It shouldn't be somebody from administration making a decision because they have no idea what's going on, okay, none. And in that case, it might have been you know, a director at each office, a tech at each office, and maybe a provider at each office. They could have made a little team and decide at what point do we decide to pull the trigger and ask for somebody to be shifted around and then the other, per, the other office would agree to it. And then once you create your team decision about what you're gonna do, you're not gonna have a democracy in the team, not everybody's gonna agree, but once the team agrees on this is the plan, then the rest of the team needs to support it, okay? And that's a modern workplace leadership model that's sort of being, you know, sort of going on in the companies like Google and Amazon and companies that really are growing fast and learning how to develop and let leaders lead from the front lines. A meritocracy. So when you're trying to figure out who to ask, too often, you know, I'm going to meetings and people are asking me to make final decisions on things that I don't even understand what you're talking about. So me making a decision is almost like asking me to go through the last few hours of discussion you had and figure out the pros and cons. And certainly I don't have gifted ability to make decisions. I certainly can make decisions when I have information. 
But if you're the one responsible for implementing the changes, or responsible in case of Jesse's case, she's responsible to make sure the patients with phlebectomies move through quickly, make sure the instruments get washed, make sure that we're not short of instruments, and she should make that decision. When the staff's trying to just figure out where people need to be shifted at, they shouldn't be pushing that up the chain of command too high. And too often I see where, when we're talking about getting things going, people want to in, get people from administration involved as if moving things up the hierarchy are going to uh, make decisions easier. In fact, it makes decisions much more erratic because the person that makes the decision probably has the least product knowledge or least knowledge of the problem. And what that will lead to is failure. When you look at leadership, there are many ways somebody could be a leader. They could be born into it, to be like a prince or a king, or like in, in uh, North Korea, it's the, you know, the son of the prior dictator. And they're you know, made, the, made the leader. And that's obviously horrible, nobody respects them. And there are leaders who just sort of take it. They, they are uh, respected because they've made decisions that have a positive impact on their coworkers. They're thoughtful to other people. They have humility. In other words, they think about other people more than themselves. They look at what's best for the team rather than what's best for themselves. And that's how you make decisions. That's how you choose your leaders. And as time goes on, you, know, you, you have something that you're following as a leader and eventually you become a leader yourself. And then when you're making decisions, you, know, you don't want to push that up the chain of command too high because if you go to somebody that's saying in administration, you go to me, you're asking somebody in a position of authority that's bestowed upon them to make decisions. Whereas if you ask the people who have the most impact into carrying out that task or to who's going to be you know, using the equipment, have them make the decisions. The decision will actually be more accurate. It won't be 100%. Okay? And you shouldn't even question the decisions when they're wrong. When they're wrong, you, know, you have to acknowledge, learn from it, and change the decision. But the reality is that from a standpoint of our practice to grow, we're relying on you to make decisions on your own. And I think you're much better off making you know, 20 or 30 decisions in a day making a couple wrong ones and then fixing it the next day, then trying to get a big group together and making the perfect decision six months from now, because it'll probably wind up being wrong anyways. So that's the Friday Focus. Uh, I want to talk to you about the transporting around and uh, how we're going to reimburse you for your time. And I want the staff to start, you know, you can email it to HR. Donna might redirect you if she wants to email to, I think it's HR, Lure Medical Spa. So put in the extra hours you drove and the extra miles you drove when you're asked to go to another location. If you're already here and punched in, just send your miles, okay, because we don't want to, like, we're not going to check what you, you know, we're not going to check up on you. Eventually, we'll have a better system for right now. You know, it's your time that you did, and you did it for the good of the office, and we're going to, you know, pay you for that time and for the extra driving. Uh, we are a meritocracy, not a democracy, and not a uh, monarchy. And the way we're going to go forward making decisions is we're going to push that to the front lines as much as possible and try to, like, I'm going to try to train the leadership staff when they're asked to make a decision, kind of give it back to the team members that has the most impact on. That's Friday Focus. Thank you very much.